மேடை உள்ள மரியாதைக்குரிய கால் இங்கே கூட்டி இருக்கும் மதிக்குரியவர்கள் என் இனிய மாணவ செல்வங்களே சகோதர சகோதரிகளே at the very outset i would like to congratulate thiru ravi kumar and his team for last 20 years he has been working tirelessly to promote tirukural to get its due place in the outstanding works of the world getting it international recognition and also working hard to further immortalize it by a project which he is tirelessly pursuing to engrave every kural on a mountain this will be a unique tribute to our great sage tiruvalluvar and a place of pride for all of us in tamil nadu in the whole country about a year back when i came to this estate one of the first book i was introduced to was tirukural and since then i have been reading it trying to understand the insights the meaning of every kural i have about one dozen translations of the kurals done by about a dozen other authors right from the british time to the contemporary time every time i open the book and i read a kural i i feel overwhelmed by the depth of thoughts the depth of meaning inherent in every word every of every kural of course its literary genius is amazing composing all these kurals in a such a symmetrical way that it completes in one and half line it's poetic in rendition it's a work of an incredible literary genius i feel completely overwhelmed by the range of issues that it discusses it touches upon its breadth and depth i think it will take perhaps a lifetime for people to understand the full meaning the full context of it 
Last time I had the privilege to inaugurate a Tirukural conference in Coimbatore. Tiru Ravi Kumar had given me the opportunity. And this is the second time I am doing it. You know, I have ex expressed some of my views. I don't claim to be an, a scholar of Tamil, but the fact is that it has been translated by so many authors, so many, so many people, learned people. All these has helped me in getting some insight Though I'm learning Tamil and I do understand, I read the newspaper, but I don't have that, that desired degree of confidence. I don't like to embarrass you guys by speaking my Tamil. One thing which has actually struck me when I began reading, I find it a very unique mix of a Dharma Shastra and a Niti Shastra. It's a spirituality as well as Niti Shastra is about righteous conduct for everyone, what we call, you know, Adhyatma, a spirituality when I say it's Adhyatma, and Niti Shastra where the righteous duties of different, 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 different people, right from king, the ruler, Raja Dharma, to Pitri Dharma, Putra Dharma, all how people should conduct themselves. So it's a unique blend, a unique mix of the two. It, of course, it begins with a bhakti, total surrender to Adi Bhagavan, the Supreme God. It moves on. It talks about how to control one's indriyas, one's senses, five senses. That helps the person in freeing oneself not only in the higher evolution, but freeing himself from the cycle of birth and death. And in a, in a graded way, when you control at one point, in its second ten couplets that it begins from 21 onward, for third, third, third segment, it also says that if you have those who have controlled their Indriyas, five senses, the reward of which they will get in seven births. Seven births is something that people will all talk about. It talks about sannyasa, renunciation. It is in various phases, it has, he has mentioned it, renunciation. And more precisely collected in a very collective form in one place is Kural 341 to Kural 350, where he says that person who is detached from the worldly affairs, who has dissolved his or her sense of I, ego, that person reaches a loka which, which is even rare for the gods. In our concept, in our Bhartiya Dhyatma, we have a concept of Brahma Lok and Deva Lok. Brahma Lok is a Lok of Adi Bhagavan who created the world. And, you know, it says that the Supreme God created the world. Gods, there are many gods. Heaven is Deva Loka. The gods are entitled to live in the 
Devaloka. But Brahmaloka is beyond above that. And the one who has completely dissolved his or her ego reaches the Brahmalok, which is rare even for the gods. It talks about this. In Kural 3.49 it says that those who are attached to the god and detached from the world, they, are, they get free from the cycle of life and birth and death. It talks about moksha. That is what the moksha is all about. How to free oneself from the cycle of birth and death. It talks very, very categorically clearly through sannyas, how do you attain moksha? It talks about ahimsa, love to all creatures, every being. When he talks, when you read his kurals on ahimsa, you get reminded of Jain Rishi's Rishavdev to Mahavira. They all talked about ahimsa. This has been our Bhartiya Dhyatma. When he talks about freedom from the cycle of life and death, you feel, you, you feel the echoes of Buddha, Lord Buddha, Nirvana. Nirvana is what? It is the freedom from the cycle of birth and death. And that is what moksha in Sanatana Dharma it is said. Now, it goes on and on and on. Unfortunately, we only talk, we, we have presented this as a book on code of conduct. And it has been, it has been conditioned. We have all have been conditioned in last over hundred years to look at it only as a book which tells you the code of conduct, how one should behave and how one should not behave. The whole spirituality of it, which is so rich, and it carries the echoes of our Bharatiya Dhyatma, Indian spirituality, is played down. So much so, without meaning anything to our first speaker. She also called it a great literary work. Yes, no doubt about it. It's a great literary work. Masterpiece. But somehow, Professor Velra said it is the root of our Indian culture. But somehow we feel shy of talking about spirituality. It's the source of our spirituality. Why? This conditioning which began in the colonial period, it persists. The first, one of the first person who came and translated this Thirukural was G.U. Pope. Now when I say some people take offense to that and noises are made, you cannot suppress the truth by noise. We must understand what damage Jiu Pope has done and what was his mission in India? You know, in 1813, the British Parliament had passed a law. It, was, it is called India Charter Act 1813. You are all intelligent people, well-read people. I urge you to look into it. India Charter Act of 1813. This act of British Parliament mandates the British government, East India Company, everyone, to evangelize India. This was a clear mandate given by the British Parliament to the East India Company and all the people associated with it and the British government that their job is to evangelize India. 
And in this background, people like G.U. Pope and Bishop Caldwell, they came. He was a member of SPG, Society for Promotion of Gospel. He came and he, one, besides learning Tamil language, he started translating that sacred text of this place. And in this translation, he de-spiritualizes it. He plays it down. The very first Kural, when it talks about Adi Bhagavan, Adi Bhagavan is an expression understood in any Indian languages. Tell in Malayalam, Kannad, Bengala, Assamese, Punjabis, Hindi. Any language you say Adi Bhagavan, everyone understands it's a supreme God. But what is the word he used? When Jiu Pope used, he called it primal deity. Every primitive society has its deity. Whichever society you go, you go in any other tribal area, any part of it you go, every society has its, pr the, every primitive society has its own set of deities. So calling it primal deity, why did he call it God? Because he knew God. He could have called it God. We all, we, we, we still believe, we, we, we all respect God. We all pray to God. But he didn't use the word God. He used the word primal deity. Language is very powerful. It gets rooted in you. Basically trying to underplay the civilization. Basically try to underplay the spiritual evolution of the people of this place. Great Thiruvalluvar has used different expressions for gods in different kurals. At some places in the, in the, in the area where he talks about renunciation, sannyas, he calls them, when he says that even the, those who have dissolved their ego goes to the loka, which is not even at, attainable for gods, he used the word vanur. He has different expression for gods. Adi Bhagavan is Adi Bhagavan. But Jiu Pope calls him a primal deity. I wonder how it has not struck to any of us. And subsequently, this de-spiritualized Tirukural has been used for political purposes by people for their vested interest. By people, those who don't believe in God. It became a handy translation. And since then, we have made a statues of Tiruvalluvar. We pay floral tribute to him because Tiruvalluvar lives in the heart of our people. Every Tamil person, he lives in the heart. He's so dear. He cannot be ignored. So, you hijack him. And hijack him in a de-spiritualized manner. Where you reduce it to a code of conduct. I think this is not being fair. Tirukural has to be restored in its full glory. It is, it is an outstanding work. Outstanding book. It is an outstanding combination of spirituality and Niti Shastra, Dharma Shastra and Niti Shastra. It has to be appreciated in its fullness. And that is where I would urge our people not to listen to me what I am saying, not to listen to anyone. Read yourself, try to understand, go into the depth of it. Because what great Tiruvaruvar said, it is the sum and substance of Bharti Adhyatma. This is our identity. This is what makes us who we are. It is a far greater work than a mere book of do's and don'ts, a code of conduct. We call it ethics, that's all. I mean, this de-spiritualization 
is denial of our heritage our spiritual heritage and our culture itself is a derivative it derives from that heritage so it is also a denial of our culture at a time when our country is moving forward we are the india is rising india is awakened it is unstoppable it will march we have entered the amrit kal 25 years the next quarter century of building india into a developed countries taking it to the summit of world leadership by 2047 when the country would be celebrating and many of you young students would be at the helm of a uh, helm of affairs celebrating the centenary of this country this country has to be where what where is its destiny lies and it is for the good of the world now the recurrent edition that the book which we have released today for the peace and harmony in the world This is Bhartiya Dhyatma. Sarve bhavantu sukhina, sarve santu naramaya. Vasudhai vakudumbakam. This is, happens only in Bharat. It doesn't happen anywhere else. This Vasudhai vakudumbakam. And that is why Tirukural belongs to the world. It doesn't belong to one set of people. Tiruvalubar was for the whole world. But that, that is precisely what our saints and seers from time immemorial came. till the present day time of swami vivekananda rishi arvindo they all said that rise of bharat is for the benefit of the world because the western world is too much engrossed in adhi bhautik buddhi this is a material buddhi this spiritual awareness seeing divinity in all looking at everyone all of you sitting here are, is i see myself reflected in all in manifest different different myriad faces when one start seeing that what what great tiruvalluvar says when i dissolve my i and i become even i becomes zero i get merged in the whole this is bharatiya adhyatma this is the root of vasudhaiva kutumbakam this sanskar this belief this faith is in the dna of bharatiya in india and that is why the, to save the world india has to rise and india is rising and india will rise it is unstoppable in this rise we don't have only to rise materially of course we have to be the leader in industry in that we have the science and technology we have to be leader there is no question of it but if you stop at that india will be a poor imitation of the west after all west also has it we must have it but what makes bhar india india what makes us what what we are is our spirituality when we rise we our spirituality also has to rise there has to be a comprehensive resurgence and in this comprehensive resurgence tirukural has to get the due place which it deserves and it will get a due place because eventually we all know satyam eva jayate truth only prevails and it will prevail it cannot be suppressed by noise it cannot be suppressed by by people with certain vested interest it cannot be projected and cannot remain in its diminished diminutive size you see i have seen I, I, as i told you i have got 20 translations but each translation has just just one to two or or kind of three lines no i mean there are very few who have gone into depth we have to go we have to appreciate the full beauty of it the and that is possible only when we delve into the spirituality of it it has to be translated it has to be understood in its full dimension and that will be a great contribution to the rise of india that will be a great contribution to the benefit of the world 
so i would urge all of you including those who are working towards taking it to its place don't feel shy don't reduce it to a literary document don't reduce it to a piece of culture it's a far more comprehensive document it is a document that represents india it's the ethos of india the th thought of india the identity of india friends i wish all of you very good luck good fortune good life ahead and this team of ravi kum mr ravi kumar and all all the great success and i certainly will continue exhorting and doing my best whatever i can thank you very much namaskar dear